So, welcome. Good evening to another interesting lecture of the module Emerging Fields in Architecture. Uh, today we have a special guest. Um, he is in America, in the US, but will be soon in Vienna again at the TU. Uh, Sebastian Fürthauer. Sebastian Fürthauer is interested in the physics of cellular scale processes, which is cell division and cell motility and the role in development biology. After earning his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Physics of Complex Systems and the Max Planck Institute for Cellular Biology in Genetics in Dresden in Germany, he did research at the Tata Center for Interdisciplinary Sciences in Hyderabad in India. Also the Courant Institute at New York Universities and Harvard University. He then joined the Flatirion Institute Flatiron Institute of the Simons Foundation in New York City, where his work focused on understanding the role of self-organized processes in the microtube cytoskeleton of, of cells, which enable the segregation of chromosomes during cell division. Um, his group at the TU Wien will be dedicated to understanding how cytoskeletal networks function in cells and how cells organize into tissue, using approaches from theoretical and numerical physics. Um, this is a lecture that is really out of the box and emerging in the fields of architecture. And I'm looking forward to discuss um, issues of organization, probably, how, and biotechnology, how they can be related to architecture with Sebastian Fürthauer and you, the students of TU Wien. Uh, Sebastian Fürthauer is in the move. So in, he, in two weeks, he just told me he will be in Vienna and you will start your work here from next semester, probably. Is this right, Sebastian? Uh, yeah, I think my contract starts 1st of February. That's okay, my, so welcome we back. Officially start shop. Yeah. Uh, welcome back and thank you very much for agreeing to have this lecture talk discussion with us. I'll hand over the microphone to you now. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much for inviting me and um, hi to all the students. Uh, I think this talk will be as out of the box for me as it is for you. So um, please interrupt me if I am talking too much physics or biology or if anything is unclear or if something is clear and just interesting and you want to ask, um, feel free to just jump in. Um, so my work is mainly interested in linking uh, what is developmental biology, which is largely the study that tells you how do you get from chromosomes to organisms like um, flies or mice or us, uh, using the concepts, concepts from soft matter physics, which is uh, the science that basically taught us how to think about uh, complex molecules forming materials, and which we then could use to build stuff like this LCD screen, which you see the lower end of the screen. All of this will hopefully make more sense by the end of this talk. But I just wanted to show this slide because also there's a link to my homepage. If there's anything you want to ask me after the talk, you will find all the contact data, also references and reviews about some of the stuff that we are, that we are talking about today um, under this link. Okay, so what I thought would be uh, fun to do here is to sort of give you a little bit of an overview of the physical concepts uh, and the physical processes that uh, inside cells allow to build the complex architecture of a single cell and of an organism. And the, the structure that basically does all of the work in this is like this vibrating mess of filaments that move seemingly by magic that we see here in the background. So what you exactly see here is you actually see an experiment that we did together with people at Harvard Med, 
where we uh, took the eggs of a frog, Xenopus levis, uh, squished them, put them in a centrifuge, spun out everything that's solid, and now you get the interior of a living cell that is still alive, that still breeds, that still has all the chemistry of a living cell. And what you can do in there is you can put in uh, the structures, a structure that triggers like automatically the formation of complex structures in there, which is mediated by these complex networks which, which coexist and build structures. Social networks uh, are really some form of self-organized architecture. In order to help you with that, let me just take a step back. Um, I, have what, a, I have a question. Yes. How can you see this? Do you use a, what device do you use to see so, and that? Or? So the, the way this works in the frog, so these frogs are just regular frogs. Uh, and what you see here are microscopy images. So this is, this is done with what is called a spinning disk microscope. And the way to see these different structures is that to these frog egg extract, you can add uh, what is called fluorophores, which are little fluorescent proteins. You probably heard of GFP, green fluorescent protein, which got the Nobel Prize some 10 years ago. Um, and you can attach them specifically via biochemical tricks to specific structures that float around. And here there's like three different colors of fluorophores in the same structure that have been added to the solution. And you shine a laser that excites the fluorophore and that shines some light in a specific color packet. And then you can see where these structures are. So that is in a nutshell how the visualization here works. Um, okay, but let's, get, let's start at the beginning. What we really want to understand is uh, we all started our life as this thing on the left-hand side which is basically one round egg cells uh, fertilized by a sperm um, with not much spatial structure. And what we want to understand is how do we get from, from this relatively simple sack of chemicals to something like a human being, uh, which has complex organization, which has structure and the different parts of the body can do different things. The first thing that you have to do in order to do that is you have to go from one cell to more cells. And just to give you a sense on how frequent this process is, in order to form any, any one of you, you have roughly 10 to the 13, that is 10 trillion cells. So you need 10 trillion cell divisions. And that's a, that's a number which is very hard to imagine. Um, just to give you a sense, this is 100 times more than there are stars in the Milky Way. And if you just think about how often cell division occurs, because cells also die. So even in, in us adults, cells keep dividing. Uh, right now, about, one, about 0.1 trillion cells or 100 million cells, 100 billion cells uh, divide in each of our bodies, which is about the same number as the cells in the Milky Way as we, as we speak. So obviously this process is uh, kind of important. But if you just had that, this would just get you from one cell to 10 trillion disorganized cells, so to a huge blob of cells. If you, if you, if you look at, at the Vitruvian man, there's obviously more that has happened. Uh, in the Vitruvian man and in all of us, our front is different from our back. Uh, our head is different from our feet. And maybe a little bit more subtle, the left-hand side of our body is different from our right hand side. For instance, the, um, our heart is on the left hand side of the body, whereas other organs like the lung on the right hand side is bigger and things like that. So there is, there is a structure. Uh, and since we all look pretty much the same, at least at the, at the scale of this, of this description, uh, the structure is somehow encoded in the genome and in the processes that lead you from the single cell to the complex organism. And that is uh, something which inherently has a lot of physics in, in it. So you have, in order to achieve this, you need to move cells around and push them in the right directions. Um, and that is, that is basically what we want to understand. Okay, 
But the first step, and that is what I will focus in most of this talk on, is how can you make more cells? But before I, before I go there, maybe it's a good idea to just see whether there's something conceptual here that, that people want to ask about before I go on, um, or whether, whether I should just continue. Um, I have a question again. Um, I'm starting at, because I've just okay. reminded of the genotype and phenotype of cells. Exactly. So there is, there is like, there's like, of course, the map from genotype to phenotype, which encodes all of this, which is sort of the, the software of a biological organism. Uh, I want to talk about what, so to say, the hardware. There's like this whole machinery which reads out the genetic information gives you an initial state, and from this state you have to build stuff. So um, in a way, like in a very simplified way, the genome is something like the, the blueprint, but in, at least in a macroscopic world, a blueprint doesn't build itself. You need all the machines around the blueprint that can read it, that can construct things and put them together in the right way. So this is the, um, the, the physics part of it. Okay, so how do you make more cells? Uh, and you probably remember some of this from high school, but basically uh, the way this works uh, in, a, in a high school's picture that most of the time cells hang out in prophase, basically, um, or in metaphase, which is not depicted here, uh, in, in prophase, uh, and where they basically wait and grow and generate more material, um, uh, more material, and just become bigger. But at some point, uh, they start to um, to get ready for division. So they round up is the first thing that happens. Then um, the genetic material, which hung out in a way in a in chromatin form, so in a form that biological processes can read and use to build more protein and build more structure. Uh, and they're reorganized uh, into uh, these little X-shaped structures, the chromosomes. Chromosomes are then collected in the middle of the cell in metaphase, by a structure called the mitotic spindle. Um, then they are pulled apart and divided between two daughter cells that then split off. So in order for, and to the left here, you see sort of one of the earliest observations of all of this, which is by Walter Fleming in 1882. These are the cells of a newt, a lure, um, where, you can, where you can sort of follow these same structures. These sausage-like things uh, are the genetic material, the chromosomes. You see the cell rounding up. You see the spindle, which is the structure that will collect and divide the chromosomes starting to form in figure E. You see the chromosomes being centered here and then being pulled apart. So the, the reason why this, I think why I'm giving a talk here is even this process um, requires a lot of uh, self-organization. So you basically in each of the cell cycles have to build one of these spindles from scratch, which means like as many times as uh, the stars in the, in, the, in the Milky Way right now in your body, you have to uh, use this thing to find chromosomes. In order for later being able to divide the chromosomes between the two sides, you have to somehow find the middle of the cell, um, and then you have to um, pull stuff apart. So all of this has a lot of spatial organizations. And here's a, here's a slightly more modern depiction of this process. So this is a movie that my colleague Reza Fahadifa here in New York gave me. Um, this is the embryonic cell, the first, the fertilized egg uh, of a worm called C. elegans. And what you see here uh, on the left-hand side uh, is the spindle that has just formed and colored in red uh, by a marker that goes to histones, uh, you see the chromosomes. So now you see this structure uh, as it has found the chromosomes aligning itself with the central axis of the cell by itself, finding the middle and then pulling chromosomes apart. Um, so if you, if you um, go a little bit deeper, you can now start to ask 
uh, what is this structure actually? And we did some of this work a couple of years ago uh, when we basically took one of these cells uh, together with colleagues from, from Dresden. Stephanie Redemann was the lead author on this. Uh, she's now in Virginia uh, at UBC. Um, and flash froze the cell um, at uh, the point, at the, at the meta phase point. So basically, if this movie loops again, I'll call it out for you, basically at around this position. And what you can then do, yeah, then you can uh, do higher resolution imaging by electron tomography and get a very detailed picture of the instantaneous architecture of one of these cells, of one of these spindles. That is what I'm showing you on the right-hand side. So really what these spindles are is a mess of tubular filaments uh, that have the chromosomes, the genetic material in the middle, and these poles on the side. So the cartoon picture uh, that people have arrived at from, from this and other work, and, and earlier work, it's really you would think of a spindle as the structure made out of polymer filaments, rod-like filaments. And I've been using the word microtubule a lot. They're really little tubes. That's, that's really how you can think about that, uh, that, that live in cells. They're organized around two spindle poles, which are these structures here. Can you see my pointer? Probably not. Probably I should find. Can you guys see my mouse, mouse pointer? Mm, yes, yeah. yes. Yes, OK. Um, so there, there's these two spindle poles on each side, the chromosomes in the middle, and they're anchored. Everything is anchored to the cell surface by uh, these guys here, which are little motor molecules which pull from the thing on the outside and help it to send them. Um, so I guess that would be another good point. Oh, well, maybe I'll show you the same slide. Uh, this the next slide. There's, and while there's like between different cells and cell types, quite some diversity about exactly uh, how these spindles look. Um, the general structure, like this general cartoon picture here is, is really conserved between cells, cell types, uh, and different types of animal. So here, as an example, I show you the, the worm embryonic spindle from the, from the uh, very beginning. And to the right, uh, I'm showing you another example of a spindle. This guy is smaller, but it still has the two poles. It has the genetic material in the middle, and it has, um, has like the this, this structure of, of tubular filaments. Uh, this example comes also from a worm, but from a germ cell. So from a, this, this comes from the unfertilized egg as it is about to form. Um, okay, so uh, is there any questions about what a spindle is or anything else that I mentioned and that, was, that I went too fast over? Okay, so um, really what, what now the challenge is, is you, to, to function uh, and to, to do all of this, uh, there's sort of a sequence of, of self-organization steps that you need to go through. Um, you need, first need to build the spindle, then you need to center the spindle and the chromosomes in the cell. Uh, then you have to sort of find the middle, after you found the middle of the cell, you have to split exactly at the half and move exactly the half number of chromosomes to the left and to the right. And then something else that the spindle will do is it sort of tells the rest of the cells where it has to split up. Um, and just here to the right, this, this structure that I'm showing you, that is actually a spindle from another cell. This comes from human, uh, from, from HeLa. Um, it's a cancer cell line. Um, that's a picture from the Tollage lab that are in Zagreb, I think. Um, okay, I will mainly focus in this talk about how the spindle can build itself, because I figured that illustrates a lot of the concepts that might be interesting for you guys. Um, and uh, so that is what I will try to try to, to think about. So how do you how do you achieve this type of architecture without an architect, how do you build this thing automatically? 
Um, so obviously there's, there's not like a blueprint for the Eiffel Tower, like for the Eiffel Tower here, but there's kind of uh, similar elements that you have to, similar, similar questions that you have to solve. And sort of the, the, first, the first thing that you, that you have to think about is uh, you have to start to learn about what these filaments that, that make up the material actually are. Like in the case of this man built structures, it is just metal rods. Uh, here, um, you have to think about these microtubules. Should you think about them as static rods or is there something more happening? So uh, if you look at the microtubule in, uh, so th this is just a, a computer generated image, but uh, comes from, from years of doing electron microscopy on these types of structures. So we know pretty well what these structures look like. Um, these microtubules are polymer filaments. Um, they're real hollow tubes made out of, in general, 13, what is called protofilament. So each protofilament is one of these lines that you see there. Um, and they have two ends, which are structurally and chemically different, which in the field we call plus and minus end, which has nothing to do with an electric charge. That is just um, how the nomenclature has established. And during the life of a microtubule, it starts basically as a little microtubule nucleus, and it keeps growing uh, for a while from the plus end. So there's more of the building blocks. So these little building blocks are uh, tubulin dimers. These are the building blocks of microtubules. It keeps just adding more of this, these, these little building blocks until uh, an event uh, that is called catastrophe uh, occurs. Uh, and the microtubule randomly switches to, to, to shrinking very suddenly. Um, what that means is that each of the rods that a spindle is made of has a very finite lifetime. So these lifetimes have been measured. Uh, in most spindles, uh, microtubules live around 15, 20, 30 seconds. So they grow and shrink and are gone after 30 seconds. Um, and as they do so, have an average length of six microns, so six thousandths of a millimeter or something like that. And the lens, lens is, because of this growth and shrinkage pro process, uh, distributed exponentially. So you have much more short microtubules and a few long microtubules at the tail of the distribution. Um, again, to give you a sense about what that means, is like these uh, in our Eiffel Tower analogy, there's already a very big difference in this Eiffel Tower. Someone went at some point and put like the metal struts there. And uh, I don't know how many they replace ever, whether they ever replace any of those, but they pretty much stay put for the lifetime of the structure. In contrast, in these spindles, each of these filaments is replaced every 15, 20, 30 seconds or something like that. Um, this is especially, especially striking if you also try to compare this number to the lifetime of spindles. Um, I guess the most striking example are meiotic spindles, like the spindles that do the cell division to go from um, normal cells to something like egg cells. In human women, uh, the meiotic spindle is basically in, in their egg cells, it's basically formed while they are still in utero, while they are still in their mother. The egg cells are formed. The spindle sits in basically in metaphase, basically in this state here, until menopause. So the structure can be stable for, what do I know, 40, 45 years. Um, however, each element of the structure is replaced every 15 seconds. So um, that makes that makes like, the self-organized architecture already in its building materials quite different from something that you that you would be familiar from uh, on human scales. The second thing, so this is now a spindle of a frog, is that in these spindles, every one of the struts that you see there, uh, every one of these microtubules moves. So what you see on the 
on the right hand side is a static picture uh, of one of these spindles. It's this American football rugby rugby ball shaped object. Uh, and and uh, the way this has been visualized is by by putting a lot of of the fluorophores that I told you uh, about before into the substrate so that the whole structure bright, lights up right. So this is obviously a photo, but uh, if I showed you a movie on the left hand side, you would basically just see this whole structure staying put and, and shaking around a little bit uh, in the experimental chamber, but basically stay like this. Uh, what the experimentalists have done on the right hand side is that they just have used way less of this dye, way less of these fluorophores. So now, instead of one of these microtubules being fully labeled and fully lighting up um, in, under the microscope, what you have is that every like hundreds or thousand microtubule that carries one little bright dot, one little sparkle that's somewhere randomly built into its structure. And that's the sparkles that you see on the right-hand side. So the other thing that I should tell you is that uh, compared to the left-hand side, the right-hand side is, is rotated. So these poles here, would be on the bottom and on the top here. But what you see is that each of these dots moved. What, that's, what you learn from that is that each of the filaments in the spindle, like it's not uh, like, the, like the metal struts, like the Ossature Metallique in the Eiffel Tower, uh, but uh, stays put uh, where it stays put, but moves through the structure, actually from the center towards the poles, um, during the whole lifetime. So, um, what that means here means is that uh, there is motion, and if there's motion, there's something that causes this motion. There must be a driving force. And I promise I won't show you too many equations, but I felt that this one should probably be fine. F equals ma. Uh, so. There must be some forces that act on these microtubules uh, as they are in the spindle that help the construction of the process. And in general, you can think about this as some active force, some kind of driving force. And there's probably some resistance because the filaments are connected to um, the, the other filaments in the system. So there's something that prevents motion. So I just now took this F equals MA and wrote it as F active or F driving force plus F drag equals MA. The other thing that, you, that, that, that will become important here is that these structures are very small and they're in general embedded in a, uh, in a liquid that is very viscous. So instead of thinking about this structure here as like, a, like um, uh, something that you can apply a force for, to, but that will keep moving as you stop applying the force. Um, at this level, you can basically forget about the MA, forget about the acceleration. That means like if you push at a constant force, this whole thing will move at a constant speed. It's really like an ant trying to swim in peanut butter or something like that. So that means uh, two things that are seemingly contradictory and which make all of these physics uh, quite different from everything, anything you would think of on large scales. Uh, this means that the total force that each of these filaments experiences at every point in time has to add up to zero because basically uh, you never accelerate. A is basically always zero. Uh, but yet, if you see something move, it means that there's an active force that balances against the drag force, against a force that comes from being coupled into the network. Okay, so how, so how, so how would you even produce these forces? And there's, there's two ways that are important. Uh, one is, since these filaments grow and shrink, they can, of course, grow and shrink against an obstacle. If you grow and shrink against an obstacle, that will push the whole filament back. And that is something that happens near the chromosomes, where you can um, grow against them and push them around, but just growing against them and pushing them through, through space. The other thing uh, is that there's specialized molecules in cells, so-called molecular motors, that can take two filaments, if they're close enough by, grab both of them and basically walk along them, walk towards either the plus end or the minus end, there's different, different variants of that. Um, so that is another thing that makes this spindle architecture 
very different from uh, at least my understanding of human architecture, which is that uh, the way you would couple uh, your, your, your rods that you, that you build your structure out of would not be by something static, but by something uh, that can consume fuel, walk along the filaments, move and, and keep pulling on them actively by consuming energy. Uh, there's different types of these molecular scale motors. In spindles, there's uh, basically two that are very important, kinesins, which are motors that are symmetric. So they tend to have two, you can basically think of them as like two pairs of feet that are attached in the center and that grab two microtubules and walk towards the plus end. Uh, and dynins, which basically have one static end, which just hangs out at minus ends of one microtubule. And uh, a pair of feet that grabs the other microtubule and then walks to the minus end. Uh, while the details are probably too much for this talk, what I want to emphasize is that what kinds of motors you have in these structures really shapes uh, the, emergent, uh, the emergent architecture of the spindle. So what you see in the middle is a healthy wild type. Wild type is like the jargon for, as you would find it, in the natural environment uh, spindle. And what uh, these people here have done to this poor spindle is that they put a poison into the, into the structure that either kills off the, the, the kinesin motors or the dynein motors. If you kill off the kinesin motors, you go to the structure on the left, you go from this American football thing to something star-shaped. If you kill off the dynein motors, uh, you go from this uh, football shaped structure to something that had much more flared out end. Uh, both of these perturbed spindles cannot do their function. So really the way the linkers shape the structure uh, and keep the structure in shape is important for the spindle function. And, um, and so what I think the second key difference between the human scale architecture uh, that we are used to here is that the building materials uh, in the spindle don't stay, not only do they fall apart, but they also don't stay put uh, during the lifetime. They're not put together by static screws or, or whatever uh, they use here, but they're put together by molecular scale motors, which make them move through the structure throughout their whole existence. Yeah, I think that's another another good point to ask you guys for questions. Um, yes, I think this is a good point. Um, can you turn the cameras on, please? I think we haven't seen all of you at the beginning, and it is always nice for the lecturer to see who is here. Um, I have let me start but maybe you can tune in. Um, I think it's interesting the, to, sh to talk about the differences of the molecular structure to what we are, we are used to design on Earth. So f I have one question. Do you mean that biological architecture is always changing, moving, adapting? So on... Um... On the scale that we're talking about here, inside cells, uh, yes. Uh, there is, there's counter examples, right? On bigger scales, we have bones, which also renew, but on a time scale, which is much, much larger. And so you can think of bones like something that is relatively static. But on these very small scales, basically every structure that we know about sort of rebuilds itself every 30 seconds. So that means stability in the sense of, of cellular structures is instability. I mean, not instability. Stability is when cells are moving in relation to each other or yeah. renewing themselves. What happens when they stop doing that? Is this happening? Uh, well, then you're dead. Um, that's <laughs> um, so. I think that the underlying, the underlying question is why would you build a system in this way, which seems very wasteful and expensive, 
because you basically put a lot of energy into building the same thing over and over again. And in some examples, it stays around for 40 years. And there's some partial answers that we understand. What you gain by that is you gain a lot of robustness because now if um, someone comes in and breaks your spindle, after 30 seconds, you have a new one, right? If something goes, goes wrong, um, it, it's very hard to disrupt these things mechanically. We can stick needles in them. We can pull them apart. You can, can do all, all sorts of horrible things to them. And a minute later, they're back to functioning and, and, and good. And, uh, so, so that is definitely an advantage that you get out of this. Um, it comes as a very high energetic cost, like uh, constructing and destructing, these, destroying these filaments uh, is uh, very, like, like is a substantial part of the metabolism cost of the energy cost of a cell. On the other hand, it's still much, much cheaper than the, than the energy for building the material for building a new cell. So it's very hard to say what, what is being optimized for. Um, but yeah, there's, we, we, know, we understand some of the trade-offs, but, but this nature is a little bit of guesswork. Oh, that's interesting, the, the issue of optimization, because we talked a lot about optimization in the module. And, you know, there is never one solution for an optimal system. Yeah. It depends how you look at it. And what you just said, it's interesting that you see, you see something happening and obviously yeah. it's optimal, but yeah. we don't understand why. We don't understand why. We don't understand why. And um, I think another interesting aspect to your first question actually about what happens if I make these microtubules, if I keep them from falling apart, for instance. So not an answer, not a direct answer, but probably something interesting to think about is one of the best cancer drugs, anti-cancer drugs that we have is a drug called Paxil, which comes from birch tree on the Rhine. Uh, and what Taxol does is it prevents microtubules from falling apart. And what that does, if you put it in low enough doses, it, it, kill, it, it uh, makes it much harder to form uh, my, mitotic spindles, so it makes cell division much harder to achieve. And the net result is that cells that divide often, like cancer cells do, uh, die. So um, we don't really understand the mechanism, uh, but it's interesting to note that like the best cancer drug that we, that we uh, like the people would give you in chemotherapy is one that makes microtubules more stable. Mm -hmm. Is this eigentlich Grundlagenforschung, was ihr macht, oder? Ja, ich würde schon sagen. Also, uh, das heißt, ihr habt eigentlich kein konkretes Ziel für Anwendung von euch im Wissen, sondern ihr generiert einfach Wissen und die anderen können dann damit irgendwas Gezieltes machen. Ja, im Wesentlichen wollen wir verstehen, wie diese Art von Materialien sich selbst zusammenbauen kann. Und du kannst ja, also es gibt, was, was schon passiert ist, dass wir immer wieder auf Mechanismen stoßen, die, die für zum Beispiel medizinische Anwendungen nützlich werden, zu verstehen oder nützlich werden, äh, unterbinden zu können. Äh, Im Moment verstehen wir nicht, also es, mir ist kein Beispiel bekannt, wo ein Biologe gesagt hätte, wir müssen Molekül ABC unter, unterbrechen und dann ist das direkt in die klinischen Studien gegangen und durchgekommen. Also wir verstehen zu wenig vom Systemlevel, um sagen zu können, also wir verstehen, wie wir Dinge kaputt machen, aber wir verstehen mhm. nicht, wie wir Dinge so kaputt machen, dass, äh, dass, wir, ähm, dass wir Krankheiten unterbinden können, ohne, ohne den Host Uh, mhm, okay. Aber ja, das ist Grundlagenforschung. Das ist, uh, wir wollen wirklich verstehen, wie, wie, wie bauen sich diese, diese Dinge zusammen. Ja. Ja. Und du kannst natürlich auch dir vorstellen, dass du nach denselben Konzepten, weiß ich nicht, Microrobotics oder solche Dinge bauen könntest.
Okay, I guess I can... Wir, wir haben noch eine Frage von Philipp. Okay. Ah, ja. Um, ja, also... Stellen, Philipp? Äh, ja, ich wollte nur sagen, ich fand es fand, eigentlich recht spannend, weil du eben gerade gemeint hast, ähm, wenn man jetzt einfach nur Teile dieses Systems stabilisiert, in dem, in dem Fall die, diese Filament-Tubes, ja. ähm, bekommt das, also wird das ganze System instabil. Also jetzt im, im Falle von, von, von eben diesem äh, Krebsmedikament ja. zum Beispiel. Ja. Also gehört eben diese ständige Regenerierung, dieses eben, wie auch aus der Sandra vorher gemeint, diese, äh, diese ständige in Bewegung bleiben, ist essentiell für die Aufrechterhaltung dieses Systems. Uh, auf jeden Fall, ja. ja. Ich habe noch eine Frage zuvor zu dem Spindel und zu dem Aufbau, weil das so symmetrisch aussieht. Ist das wirklich alles symmetrisch? Uh, ich habe hier Beispiele aus Zellen gezeigt, die sich symmetrisch teilen. Also, wenn, also eine andere Frage dann für Organisierung auf, auf, auf größeren Skalen, in Gewebeskalen ist, du kannst entweder eine Zelle teilen und zwei gleiche Zellen daraus machen. Zum Beispiel, ja, dann hast du zwei Zellen, die dasselbe Verhalten haben und das ist natürlich was sehr oft passiert, wenn bei Leber wächst oder dann willst du aus einer Leberzelle zwei Leberzellen machen. Es gibt andere Mechanismen, wie du diese Symmetrie brechen kannst. Um, actually, wenn du genau hinschaust, in, irgendwo hatte ich diesen Film, in diesem Film hier, wenn du genau hinschaust, uh, am Ende die Stelle, wo die Zelle sich teilt, ist nicht genau in der Mitte. Das ist die erste Zellteilung in einem Wurm. Und was passieren wird, ist, die beiden Zellen, die jetzt rauskommen, sind auch nicht gleich groß. Die Zelle in der rechten Seite ähm, wird äh, später ähm, die Germline, also da werden alle, da werden, das, das, da werden alle ähm, wie sage ich das ohne Jargon, ähm, da werden alle Eizellen und, 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 äh, und das äh, später, später daraus werden. Die Zelle auf der linken Seite wird die ganz somatische Linie. Das wird der eigentliche Wurm werden. Also du, kriegst auch, du hast auch Zellteilungen, wo die Symmetrie durch andere Mechanismen gebrochen wird. Und dann kannst du durchaus Spindeln kriegen, wo eine Seite größer ist als die andere. Ähm, das ist jetzt keines der dramatischen Beispiele. Ähm, aber die Symmetrie kann gebrochen werden. Was du auch machen kannst, sogar in symmetrischen Zellteilungen, äh, du kannst jetzt hingehen und also die, jede Hälfte dieser Spindel organisiert sich um einen dieser, ich switch back to, to English, uh, is organized against one of these, around one of these spindle poles. So one experiment that people have done is that they just took a laser and they basically boiled one of the spindle poles locally. So they just chewed it down. And what you then get is half a spindle which looks exactly like half of the healthy spindle. So the construction of the two halves seems to be pretty much independent as far as we can tell. Um, and the symmetry really comes from the fact that the two poles here are relatively similar because this is a close to symmetric cell. Thank you. Any more questions at this stage? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, the long uh, tubes to the edge of the of the cell are there to orientate the uh, spindle. Yeah, exactly. So the other question that I haven't talked about at all, like the like here in this picture, you see like these tubes which go out, which are which are cut off in in this experiment. But they really reach the boundary of the cell. And at the boundary of the cell, there is, uh, I think there was a sketch somewhere in these slides. Let's see. Find this for you. Like at the boundary of these cells, there's uh, again motor molecules that attach to who, whatever, whatever filament hits the boundary of the cell and pull on them. And what that achieves for you is that the spindle 
orients along the long axis of the cell and goes uh, to the middle. So that is how, how that is achieved. Um, although that's not a universal mechanism because sometimes you have cells that are just too big to do that. You will never be able to build something that reaches the boundary, like a chicken egg. But there you have to do other things. And the form of the cell itself is uh, by pressure, or like a. So in this case, this happens inside the mother worm, and the shape of the cell is pretty much set about the, by the shape of the of the gonad of the mother worm. So I can show you, like, I simply didn't add a picture for any of these for a full worm to give you a sense. But basically, the way these eggs are formed. So this here is, is, is the gonad. So that is basically the egg factory. So what will become an egg starts out here at the top left end, and they just keep moving around. And most of the cells die at this end, and, now, and some of them become bigger and bigger. And this here on the right lower side is the, is the new egg being laid. So that's what you see here, this guy that pinches off. That's the new egg. And this process of squeezing out the new egg also sets the shape of the egg. But I don't think we, that we understand that super well at this stage, how that works. That's where we're okay. Um, And let's move on, I guess. So I figured I could now give you a few more details on how things fall apart and are destroyed. Basically, you know, I want to understand this in a, in a little bit more detail. We need to see uh, how filaments are built and destroyed and how filaments are moved around and we need to be really, really clean and understand the physics of that. And it's going to get more technical now. So really just interrupt me at any point in time, just, just yell at me. Uh, it's not like I need to finish going through these slides. Uh, it's more about it being interesting for you. Um, okay. So uh, in order, uh, of looking at these, of, of seeing it, of uh, getting such a steady state structure um, with filaments that are these, that, that have the, where you have the right amount of filament at every point in the structure, there's really two things that you can do. You can, you will have to, can either choose where you build new filaments, or you can choose where you destroy the ones uh, that, that are around. Um, so, uh, one thing that you learned from this movie that I showed you earlier on, remember these dots were just random marks on some of the filaments. What you can do in the computer is you can follow each of these dots uh, and ask, when do dots disappear? Because whenever the dots disappear, that means the microtubule that they set on fell, fell apart. Then you can ask, is there anything special about any position here along as you traverse the spindle? Um, are they like destroyed in specific places or are they destroyed all over the place? And the answer is they seem to be destroyed pretty randomly. So it's not like I, so it's because one thing that you could have imagined is that I just randomly built connections everywhere then I destroy the ones that are not good in some spatially organized way. It seems to be the opposite. What happens is that I built my filaments in a pretty targeted way and I just randomly destroy some. Um, okay, so it seems to be that uh, everything is about how you actually um, uh, build new microtubules. And uh, these processes are not super universal. I'm going to talk now about the story of the frog spindle. There's slightly different stories in, in, in different spindles and we don't really know like the, the design paradigms that, that pick which which mechanism is chosen in which spindles at this stage. But how it happens in, in these frog spindles is that near the chromosomes, which end up, which are on the center here, 
uh, there is a signaling protein called RAM. Um, these letters stand for something, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes what they stand for, uh, which has two states. It can either be bound to a molecule called GBP or to a molecule called GTP. So at the chromosomes, there is a machine that basically turns RAN GDP into RAN GTP. So you have a mechanism that turns your signaling molecule on as it touches the chromosomes. Everywhere in the cytoplasm, just everywhere in space, in the, in the, in the fluid in which all of this is immersed, uh, you uh, have a machinery that turns around GTP into around GDP. What that means is that you sort of activate your little, your little fluorescent molecules and you let them swim away randomly and they get turned off. What that gives you is that you have a little sort of signaling blob forming around the chromosome. And what people have stopped uh, for a long time is that this is the full story. That basically, if you just had RAM somewhere, you form a blob of, of microtubules or filaments, and then everything else is done by those. Um, so basically what RAN GTP then does is it talks to some other molecules called spindle assembly factors and they will produce uh, the microtubules. If you buy this theory, you just add RAN, uh, like this activated molecule to frog egg soup, uh, you should just form a disorganized blob of filaments if you don't have any more this way. The person that, that, that proved us wrong on this uh, was Sabine Petri. She is in Princeton. And she did very beautiful experiments where she did exactly uh, what uh, I just suggested, where she took structurally activated round, just piped it into the extract from a living cell. And what she saw for a long time is nothing, but then she just added one stabilized microtubule, actually with Taxol, a stabilized microtubule to the thing. And around this structure, she sees these, these fireworks emerge. So what you see here are stills from her website. Uh, the, the filaments are microtubule filaments and uh, these dots, she labels like the growing ends of different molecules on there. But she gets these, these very organized structures. What we learned from that is uh, that probably the system is slightly more complicated. Not only does RAM activate a molecule which we shall call spindle assembly factor, but this guy then in order to do something, has to bind pre-existing microtubules. Um, so basically what that does is the construction rule uh, seems to be activate like the construction crew at the chromosome, then float around until you find a bit where construction is already happening and then build up on that. That seems to be how, how filaments are uh, form, uh, formed. Uh, the part that was still unclear, and that is our little contribution to the field when, when I start thinking about these things, is whether it is sufficient to just hang out close to a filament uh, and be activated by binding, and then you can bind either in solution uh, or whether you have to be actually bound um, when, uh, when you construct a new filament. Uh, in order to figure that out, we basically did some math um, what, you, what, you, what you relatively quickly realize, if you look at one of these spindles, is that they have a very sharp interface. Like there's really material, and then it falls off over a space of basically a micron, and then there's nothing outside. So the two, the two models that I just proposed to you, were basically a nucleator, one of these blue guys, has to attach to a pre-existing microtubule to do anything, uh, or it just is localized because microtubules are sticky to it, have different predictions on how sharp the spindle interface are. Um, so we could turn that into math and compare and saw that one of the models described the data, the other one didn't. Um, so what we learned is really the way new structure, new material is constructed in the spindles is um, by, so basically filaments are, randomly destroyed everywhere. There is a signal from the chromosome that diffuses, just floats through space, waits until it finds a, a bit of spindle. And then it says, let's build more there. 
that is all that happens. So that seems like a like a pretty wasteful thing to do things and like a pretty complicated um, a way to do things. But I think one of the one of the interesting features that you get out of that, uh, and here I'm showing some work out of Jay Gatlin's lab, is that this is a way of having the size of your emergent structure being adaptive to the size of the cell that you're in. So what these guys did is they basically uh, had, a, had a little oil um, well, and they blow, blow little oil uh, bubbles, uh, little, little cytoplasm bubbles into oil. So all of these bubbles here um, are little pieces of cytoplasm and there's oil around it. And since, the, since it's, like, it's like salad dressing, it demixes. Um, and in some of these bubbles, there's nuclei and you will now see spindles form. And what they saw is that the spindle adapts to the size of the enclosure that it is in. So here's just three examples. There's a 40 micron enclosure where you have a small spindle, 55 medium spindle, 100 micron enclosure, you have a large spindle. And the way you achieve this is really by the mechanism that I just explained to you. So uh, maybe that's, a, that's another advantage of this first bit of uh, having this very complicated way of building stuff. If your cell grows or shrinks, you can react to that. Uh, you can build your structure uh, with the same blueprint, basically, at the scale that you want it to be, given the space that you have available. Um, so that's that's one of the, the other advantages that you get out of this very complicated mechanism. Uh, is there questions about that? Okay. Okay, the next thing that you need to understand uh, uh, in order to, um, to understand how this is built is how, how filaments, once, once you constructed filaments, uh, how they moved around, how do these motors actually, actually do stuff? Because what you really would want to know if you, if you were to build such a thing in the lab, you would want to be able to say, if I have a motor which has properties X and I put it in filaments which obey this nucleation mechanism, this is the structure that I would want to get out of it. Um, so how do, you, how do you actually build stuff with, with this material? Um, as I told you before, there's uh, several types of motors which are uh, important in these spindles. Um, and filaments in the spindles move. So just as a, as a little reminder, what type of motors you have in the structure changes the outcome and structure. What you need to think about, obviously, is the force balance on each of these filaments. The total force on each of these filaments is the sum of an active force uh, plus a drag force that comes from being coupled into the network. And so what we want to know is how does this inform the emergent architecture um, uh, if you, if you uh, put different motors in there. So the way we think about these systems now, um, that's to give you a flavor of how you want to think about these problems as serious. So it, if it's too abstract, please interrupt me at, at any time. I feel uh, it would be useful to get the most out of it. Um, so we just think of this as a basically a all of spaghetti of polymer filaments uh, that are tied together by cross-linking molecules. And these cross-linking molecules now can consume energy, they can consume a chemical fuel, and so they can move along the filaments. Uh, can phrase this as a math problem. So what we want to know, psi, that's basically the, that's basically the map of where everyone is. So psi is an object that lists all the positions of microtubules, xi, and all the directions which are time pi. What we want to know is how this changes over time. That's what dt psi means. What is the change of the, of the current map? In order to know that, I need to do x dot, which is how do filaments flow in position, and p dot, how do filaments reorient? So if you think about that from a mathematical point of view, you have two unknowns, x dot and p dot. If you know those, you know everything. So you need two equations. 
And I sort of already gave away my game. We know that the total force on each filament and the total torque on each filament always add up to zero. But these will be my two equations that I can use to solve for x dot and p dot. So I have to tell you what the total force of each of these filaments is. So if you think about this red guy being coupled into the network, the total force of, on each of these filaments will be the forces that come from all of its connections. And that is really what this horrible sum and integral multi horribleness means. That means you just have to consider all uh, connections that are geometrically possible, given the size of your filaments and your connectors. And once you have such a connection, there will be a rule, little fij, which is the force that filament j exerts on filament i. Um, that tells you what your motor does. Uh, so all to turn this into a theory, all we need to see is like basically have like a little prescription of how um, motors are operating in this filament network. So what people can measure in the experiment, which, which will guide our thinking about that, is they can take two filaments and uh, basically hold them either by really attaching a magnet to a filament uh, and sticking the other one to a surface or attaching a little styrofoam bead uh, to the other filament and pulling that either with light or magnetic fields. And so you can exert a controlled force between two filaments that are nearby. Um, and then you can ask how fast do they move past, past each other? And what you will typically get is you will get uh, a measurement of the speed, the velocity at which guys move. Uh, as a function of the force that you get. Uh, if these are motors, if you don't apply an external force, the motors will just walk at the speed at which they want to walk along. So that is this capital V here. That is this point where my dashed line crosses the velocity axis at zero force. If you pull to oppose the motion, uh, your motors will slow down. So you will walk along the dashed line upwards uh, until you reach a point where nothing moves. That is called the stall force because you just pull too much against the action of the motor so they can't move anymore. Um, once you have such a curve, you can write an expression for Fij. And uh, let me just parse the mathematics for you. There's this term proportional to gamma, which is just the slope of this curve. Um, if, if I just had this term, Basically, my force velocity curve, which have is preferred velocity B0. So that would just be friction between two, linear friction between two rods that are connected. So the speed would just be proportional to how strong I put on it. Um, now, the connectors here, unlike in many other materials, are active. So there's a second term, which is the force that my connectors exert by their walking motion. What that leads to graphically is it uh, displaces the zero force velocity uh, from zero. So there's a preferred velocity uh, and it adds this little term to our equation. But really all of this is, is basically you say, uh, you just respond to external forces and you know your zero state. Once you have that, you can tell everything about these materials. Um, so now you can uh, play games. And one game that we played is we, we tried to build something. We took some Taxol stabilized microtubules. Taxol is this cancer drug that I told you about earlier. So we took basically tubulin, uh, added Taxol to a suspension of tubulin. Uh, and what you get after that is stable filaments that now don't have this property that they fall apart and reconstruct themselves. Uh, and then we picked the motor, XCTK2. Uh, so X stands for Xenopus, which is the name of the frog that it comes from. K stands for kinesin, uh, which means that it's a plus end directed motor, but it's basically just the name of this guy. Uh, and we asked, can we sort of know about the force velocity curve of that? Uh, luckily, people had measured that 10 years ago. What they had measured is just take a few floating microtubules and stick one to a surface, put motors in this whole solution. What they see is that the motors basically bind everywhere where they can reach between the two filaments. And you see that also here in this graph in the middle, where you see like uh, time goes from top to bottom. 
And what you see in the middle row, you just see where the microtubules are. And when it's brighter, it's basically the overlap between the little guy and the one that is attached to the surface. In the lower channel, you see where the motors are. And what you see is they are basically everywhere where there's overlap between the filaments. Uh, and on the top, you see the, the color merge between these two channels. So what we know about XCTKT is that it binds basically everywhere where it can reach. Uh, and the other thing that we know about it, it is slide things apart at 19 nanometers per second. Uh, so once you, you know about that, what theory will tell you is that if you have a network of high enough density, basically what happens is that wherever you have overlap between antiparallel filaments, you generate sliding motion between these antiparallel filaments. And since everyone is sort of linked by motors, even to parallel guys, even if parallel motor, motors in the parallel system would just ineffectively walk between the two on their tracks, the whole system starts to move. And you can work out that what should happen in such a system is that every filament moves basically at the speed of the motor in the direction in which it points. And what's, what's interesting about that um, is that this is very robust in the sense that what's shocking here is what, not, what does not show up. What does not show up is any concentration of the motors. It doesn't matter how many motors you put into the filament. You're very robust against fluctuations of how many parts you have. And what also doesn't show up is any notion of how my network is locally organized. Because naively, you would think that uh, if you go to a system like the one on the left-hand side, if I have two parallel filaments, my motor would basically walk on both sides towards the same end, basically exert no motor forces, so nothing should move. Whereas if I found two anti-parallel filaments, I could basically push them one against the other and they would slide relative to each other. In this dense system, that is not what happens. In this dense system, basically every filament, regardless where it is in the network, regardless of the concentration of motors that you put into the network, as long as you have more than a certain threshold number, um, moves at the same speed in the direction in which it points. And so these two guys, uh, Bez and Peter. Uh, Peter is now at MIT and Bez is in Princeton, both doing postdoctoral work. Uh, Billy took Tubulin, the motor XCTK2 ATP, then they float the taxol in, so now you get filaments, and then they put this into a small microfluidic chamber. Now you get this grayish mass, which is a network of filaments, which are all oriented from the left to the right. They can now do is they can take a laser, bleach stripes in this material, and what you will see uh, once the, the movie loops is that these stripes split up. That tells you that these filaments are sliding relative to each other. But it tells you more. It tells you, like, if you, if you zoom in, and I uh, picked out a few sites on the right-hand side, you see that there's regions like the one underlined in blue here. But basically, as much stuff goes to the left as to the right, um, and regions where basically everything goes to the left or to the right. So now, if our, if our little theory here is correct, then regardless of how much motor we have into the system, uh, regardless of the local structure, which we can infer from how much goes left and right, because you would be more anti-parallel if, if everything goes, uh, if it goes both ways and more parallel uh, if it goes only one way, you should always see that the speed of these stripes is 19 nanometers per second. That is indeed what Bess and Peter find in experiments. This was, this was pretty abstract. But uh, what I want to emphasize is that this is exactly also what is happening with spindles. In spindles, the motor is not called XCTK2, it's called X5. Um, but, and it moves at a different speed, two and a half microns per minute now, it's much slower. Uh, but if our theory was correct, each of these dots, no matter where it is in the spindle, should move at two and a half microns per minute. And luckily for us, people have measured this. And uh, you can see this here on the right-hand slide. Okay, that was, that, that was pretty abstract. So I feel should accelerate here. I'll just tell you that uh, we now just reached the point where we understand enough about both the construction mechanisms and the forces in these spindles to be able to Really put all of this set of rules in a computer uh, and ask, can we, at least in a computer, recapitulate the full self-assembly of one of these spindles? And 
the answer is not quite yet, but we're getting there. And I think that's some of the, the research that will happen at the uh, will, will hopefully lead us there. I guess that's another good point for questions. Uh, thank you, Sebastian. Um, before I'm asking questions, I, I have to share a video that came into my mind. Do you know Powers of Ten? I I'm sure you know, know it. Right. From the Eames. So just stop sharing my screen for a second, and you can share it. Yes. Uh, oh, yes, maybe I can share it then, even better. Um, let me share my screen. Yes. So, you know this video, have you seen it? There was a new no, one from Google, but this no. one is original by Charles and Ray Eames. They produced this, it's a beautiful book. Oh. Um, you can see now why I have been thinking of that. Yeah. Because it's always the same, you know, at the same point that you're looking at, but in a different scale. Yeah, exactly. And the reason why I thought is that eventually what you are showing or what we think we can, why your research fits to the module and our work is that it's from the smallest to the largest part, it would be strange if it, wouldn't have similar laws, right? As, uh, as yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's, well, there, there's things which are, well, there's things that scale, right? It's, it's, and things that don't. So there's, there's definitely things which are fundamentally different between this little scale and ours. And one of those is called, uh, so, so in the, in the smaller scales, uh, things are very light, and the fluids in which you're embedded seem very viscous. Um, what that means is, for instance, well, if you shoot a rocket to the moon, it's basically all about inertia, right? You give it a push once, big explosion at the back, and it will st keep moving forever. And that is because there, inertia is important, viscosity isn't. At the smallest scales, uh, it takes a lot of energy to move small particles in a fluid. Um, this is why your, your vacuum cleaner needs to have a couple thousand watts, because it's very hard to pick up a tiny particle with fluid, which has no inertia with fluid flow just by viscosity. Um, so there is, there's some physics that is, scale, that it, that is really scale dependent uh, uh, like that. And some organizational principles which probably cross scale. So I, I think I think I think yes. Some sense it's it's the same. Some sense not. Uh, it's interesting but, when you say that because nowadays we think it's normal that you know you take a rocket and you lift yeah. off the earth. But it's only a few years ago that yeah. we know it's possible. Just one hundred yeah. years ago, people yeah. thought it will never be possible. Um, but anyhow, I have two questions before maybe the students have some questions. One is you said the spindle adapts to the size of the enclosure. This yes. is what you discovered in the experiment. And I think this is interesting because we have learned in history and also in architecture and from animals, whatever, that size is always in relation to the environment. Um, but is it really the size of the enclosure or is it also some other condition or is it really so, the, the bigger the enclosure the bigger the spindle is it relational so there's, there's, there's two scales that matter so uh, for, for this specific problem so the, so the way that it's worked is that molecules sort of uh, have to 
find the chromosomes to get turned on. That was this RAN cascade that I talked about. And so what happens is that if the enclosure gets smaller, basically you're limited by how much stuff floats around, how much of the signaling molecule floats around in total uh, in the enclosure. As you make the enclosure bigger and bigger, much bigger than the, than the scales that I showed you here, at some point, the time that it takes a random molecule to find the point where it gets turned on gets large compared to the time um, that the lifetimes of your components. So the way it works for the spindle size is that uh, if you start with small enclosures, you grow with the enclosure, but at some point you read them, reach a maximum size where increasing the size of the enclosure further uh, will not change the size of the spindle. So that is, the, that is, that is, that is how it works for this system. Yeah. Basically because there's two scales, one land scale which is set by uh, diffusion over lifetimes of molecules and one that is set by the, um, by the lifetime, by, by the size of the enclosure. And the smaller of these two sizes basically sets the size of the speed. Uh, okay, I have another question. Is there maybe one question from someone else? Um, I have one question concerning, because you, you showed an image with a minimum and a maximum arrangement. And it seems that on that level, a minimal system is not the favorite. So it seems like redundancy is more important than minimal connections, for example or minimal use of elements or... Uh, yes, you seem to be, for these types of system, you don't seem to be uh, limited by... I, th I think it, these systems are less about the efficiency concerns than about robustness. Because basically, if a spindle fails, you die. Um, so, in a way, they are, they are like on the human scale, which you would probably say they are, they are massively over engineered. They're, they're much more expensive than, than what you could do if, you, if it was about building the simplest thing, but the cheapest thing. Yeah, but this is the most robust thing. I think it's more the consideration okay, all right do you have um questions i know that we have i forgot who of you is working on artificial intelligence Maybe you have a question that fits to your reflections, Arbeit. Otherwise, I have to ask, does artificial intelligence help? Or is, okay, first of all, does it help for the research? Or you do you use it? Or do you intend to use it? And second, do you think artificial intelligence, programming, software, something can learn from the work you do? Uh, so we have people around here that think a lot about neural networks. Um, so that there's a technical aspect in which they can help, which is just really a neural network is a, in mathematical parlance, a universal function representator. And you have, you have of course the structure like, if you want to represent what these, these materials do, it's ob often not obvious how you do that efficiently in a computer. And one of the ways of doing this is basically teaching a network to map the function that you want, um, which I guess falls into the realm of, of artificial intelligence. People have thought about that. Um, the other thing where artificial intelligence and like, these types of methods come in quite a lot is in biology right now we get a lot of data 
um, for instance, from tissues. And then it is about how do you find the boundaries of cells? How do you find the spindles? How do you find the nuclei? Um, traditionally, this meant that like a lot of master students spend a lot of time on looking at all these videos and drawing lines and then punching numbers into a computer. Um, definitely artificial intelligence has revolutionized this part of the work uh, already. Um, yeah, I don't know because my impression and I'm by no means an expert of artificial intelligence is that it gives you uh, a good way of solving well-defined tasks, but at the end of the day, it just solves the tasks and it doesn't tell you what it did. It's very hard to understand what it did under the hood. Um, since in our business, it's much about understanding the specific mechanisms, often it doesn't, often it doesn't do what we need it to do. So it, it doesn't explain itself. It's very useful, but it doesn't, it's very hard to learn how it does the things it does. Somehow too close to magic. Okay, then uh, if there are no questions. I, I would have uh, Please, Sebastian. another question. In, is not entropy another, I don't know if it's a force or a, a principle that, that uh, spindles would have to fight against? And yes. Is it so, is it considered? So, so, so basically, as a, as, a, as a living system, like you have to fight entropy all the time. Basically, uh, and, the, and the way you do that is basically you put in energy, you reduce your energy, your entropy locally, and you um, uh, and you basically shoot out high entropy material at the other end. If you put your hamster in a cage and you stop feeding it, so you interrupt this flux, very soon it will reach the state of highest entropy and be dead. Um, so you keep feeding energy into the system to really actively put yourself into an organized state. Um, yeah, you have to you have to consume stuff, food. It's basically how you do it, and excreted waste product, which is high entropy. And the ATP is the the energy, the food for the. Exactly. So the so way I, I'm no expert, but the, the the way it works is, you the worm or the frog just eat something, then there is a whole cascade of of metabolic cycles where this is basically decomposed into glucose, which then mitochondria, which are structures uh, in the cell can use to produce ATP. Uh, and this ATP is energy rich. It's the fuel, it's the fuel of all cells and that fuels all the processes inside your cells. But ultimately what provides the energy is the food you eat or the animal eats. Okay, thank you. All right. Dann habe ich eine letzte Frage. Ähm, glaubst du, dass die Biotechnologie die, die Art und Weise, wie wir bauen, ja. von morgen verändern wird? Oder hast du so eine Idee, wie das sein könnte? Ehrlich gesagt weiß ich zu wenig über die Art und Weise, wie wir heute bauen, um da richtig etwas, etwas Vernünftiges dazu sagen zu können. Um. Oder was, okay, nicht jetzt aufs Bauen, auf nicht jetzt aufs Bauen beschränkt oder so, wenn du jetzt ein Ziel hättest, einen Wunsch hättest, was du mit deiner Arbeit erreichen könntest, was würdest du gerne erreichen? Naja. In der Zukunft. Also was würdest du gerne sehen aufgrund von deiner Arbeit? Also einerseits, wenn wir, wenn wir die, die Mechanismen, die das Überleben einer Zelle ermöglichen, verstehen, dann verstehen wir auch, wie all diese Dinge schief gehen können. Ich glaube, eine der für die Spindel eine der, der, der wichtigsten Fragen ist, äh, meiotische Spindeln in, in Menschen sitzen für 30, 40 Jahre äh, herum. 
und warten. Aber was wir natürlich auch wissen, ist, dass die irgendwie über die Zeit äh, schlechter zu werden scheinen. Also wir wissen, dass alle möglichen genetischen Erkrankungen in Neugeborenen um einiges häufiger werden, wenn das Alter der Mutter steigt. Ich glaube, da gibt es wirklich, wir verstehen eigentlich nicht, warum das der Fall ist. Also, ähm, aber ich würde mir vorstellen, dass wenn wir verstehen, wie meiotische Spindeln aufgebaut sind, wie sie funktionieren, wie sie Zellteilung erreichen können, ähm, dass wir da hoffentlich irgendwann mal was Nützliches machen können. Und das sei es auch nur an der Diagnostik. Ich meine, künstliche, künstliche Befruchtung ist unglaublich häufig inzwischen. Ähm, und was wir immer noch nicht gut wissen, ist, wenn in diesem Prozess, der sehr invasiv ist für Frauen, ähm, die, die, die befruchteten Eizellen wieder eingesetzt sind. Wir haben keine wirklich guten Methoden, die, die guten von den schlechten zu erkennen. Ähm, zumindest das sollte uns in relativ kurzer Zeit ähm, klar werden, wenn wir einfach wissen, was wir, auf was wir schauen müssen. Und das wissen wir, wenn wir verstehen, wie diese Dinge funktionieren. Also ich glaube, das sind relativ mittelfristig konkrete Verbesserungen, die diese Forschung bewirken kann. Also das ist nicht direkt, woran ich arbeite, aber ich glaube, das wird uns helfen. Okay. Ja. Wunderbar. Ich danke dir, Sebastian. I thank you very much. Ja, yeah, thank you so much. Das war a lot of fun. Talk and um, I wish you a warm welcome here at the TU Wien. And I'm looking forward to your research team work. Yeah, it will be, will be fun. And I think I showed you guys the, the, my contacts, my, at least my webpage uh, address. So if you have other questions that came up, that come up, just feel free to send me an email. I will try to reply in a timely fashion. And if I forget, just shoot me another one. Thank you very much. Was Thank you. Pleasure to have you here. Have yeah, a good nice. evening, all of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.